I love the new day in all respects but one. Don't you tell me not to be sour. I was born sour, then I became a wrestling fan. It got worse since then. Kofi Mania was one of those flukes of wrestling, the kind of accidental lightning in a bottle events that reminds you that A, wrestling is a living, breathing product that still has the capacity to evolve in surprising and emotionally resonant ways, and B, WWE really doesn't like it when that happens. WWE's like a parent who books a, a really nice holiday for themselves, but then their kid brings an adorable puppy home and then suddenly they have to make all these new plans on the fly. And so the parents just try to subtly and quietly drown the puppy and then the kid starts crying. So they hang you know, towel the puppy off. I say, okay, there you go, play with it. We do have to catch that plane though. Hey, look over there. We just, why, why, keep looking. Why weren't you done? In one sense, I understand Ryanair doesn't do refunds, but also Kofi Kingston first debuted in WWE in 2008 on ECW as a man committed to Jamaica's crazy and wouldn't let the fact that he was African rather than Jamaican stop him from doing that. Now, to be fair to the big dub and spoilers, I won't be fair to the big dub a lot in this video. That was actually the gimmick that Kofi had on the independent circuit. He was, being Jamaican was his idea before joining the company. So in 2009, he got hit on the head probably and became from Ghana, it's always happening, and was promoted to an upper mid card fighting for Raw on bragging rights, eating the pin, sure, but then getting involved in the main event of John Cena versus Randy Orton, which translated into a feud between the Viper and Kofi, which was a big deal. Kofi was feuding with a former WWE champion, having big hero segments like that huge boom drop from the railing in November, and then, the push ended in a way that could best be described as stupid. In a triple threat match between John Cena, Randy Orton and Kofi Kingston, again, look at him in the mix with those two. Kofi botched the finish of the match. Orton blew his top and so the story goes. The real life heat cost Kingston a penciled money in the bank victory that year. And over the next decade, Kofi became an entrenched mid-carder. A charismatic mid-carder, absolutely, but a mid-carder seemingly for life. He became part of the New Day in 2015 they got over like crazy as obnoxious heels before Kofi settled into a reliably lucrative comedy act with easy, utterly convincing friendship chemistry with Big E Langston, now called Big E, and Xavier Woods, now called King Woods which is lovely. They could pull match of the night tag matches out of their ass with minimal prep. New Day versus the Usos was the best feud of 2017. And people didn't expect more from Kofi and that was, it was fine. It was fine. A position in the company that worked that no one really questioned until February 2019 and the lightning in the bottle. Elimination Chamber was fast approaching, featuring a chamber match for Daniel Bryan, sorry, the new Daniel Bryan's WWE Championship. In that match, Samoa Joe, Randy Orton, Jeff Hardy, AJ Styles, the new Daniel Bryan, and Mustafa Ali. On the February 12th episode of SmackDown, a gauntlet match was to be held to determine who would enter the Elimination Chamber last with one issue was that Ali suffered a bad concussion at a house show in Indiana and was pulled from SmackDown and Elimination Chamber entirely. It was announced he'd be replaced by a member of the New Day. And when that was first announced, be honest now, no one cared. Then the gauntlet match happened. Kofi wrestled Daniel Bryan with time to spare, which by the way, is a really good way to make someone look good. He held his own against D. Bright, wrestled a style we hadn't seen from him in quite a while before, holy sh pinning the WWE Champion. Absolutely huge. He went on to wrestle for ages after that, pinning Jeff Hardy, Samoa Joe, AJ Styles with commentary asking, is this the best Kofi Kingston of his career that we are seeing? The best bit of that match, AJ Styles telling an exhausted Kofi to just stop. It's all right. It's over. And Kofi shoving AJ away saying, no, I've waited too long. I've waited 11 years. And everyone at home realizing that that's right. That 
He's right! On one night, Kofi's survival allowed WWE to tell an organic story, one steeped in actual tangible history where the pieces just fell into their lap. A story that shifted the audience's perspective of someone who'd been a mid-carder for a full decade. It was an exhilarating moment. Again, a moment of living, adapting, wrestling. And the audience thought, you know what? We're not gonna let this one go. Kofi Mania built steam with perfect underdog booking at the Elimination Chamber pay-per-view before falling off the rails a little bit on the road to WrestleMania itself. It was mostly fine. It wasn't exactly Daniel Bryan's run to the top in 2014 where the plans literally changed at the last possible moment. Like even before Fastlane, Kofi Mania was the plan going into WrestleMania 35. It's just that the way they went about it was a bit weird. Like Vince didn't like Kofi. Why don't you like Kofi, Vince? Vince said, and honestly, the lack of cogent reasoning behind Vince repeatedly stripping Kofi of opportunities, it just made the whole thing look like Vince was an old Karen shouting at an African man in the street whilst also reassuring everyone that, oh, I'm not racist. I've got one black friend and his name is Dwayne The Rock Johnson. However you look at it, not explaining why the villain is doing things beyond sheer villainy, it's not great. A few months and many gauntlet matches later, Kofi got his Daniel Bryan branded WrestleMania moment against, quite appropriately, Daniel Bryan himself. Wrestling the new Daniel Bryan with time to spare, which by the way, is a really good way to have a great WrestleMania match. Kofi pinned him, was crowned WWE Champion, and it was genuinely unutterably lovely. And then, eh, just, eh. Like Kofi held the title, the WWE title, I'll remind you, for 180 days, one, eight, zero. And the number of pay-per-views that he main evented as champion, well, it was one of those three numbers, and it wasn't the eight. It wasn't the one. Kofi Kingston, WWE Champion, closed the show on pay-per-view zero times. Like not once, be beat KO at Money in the Bank, didn't main event. Then because of Saudi ethics, KO was shoved out of the way and downgraded to Dolph Ziggler at Super Showdown. And then again, at stomping ground. Like Dolph Ziggler, it... <sighs> Dolph, he, I like Dolph Ziggler. I'm not one of those people that hates Dolph. Like he's, he's good, but he's also like the angel of death for new exciting stars, isn't he? Nakamura. At Extreme Rules, Kofi retained against Samoa Joe. Again, fair enough, but didn't main event. It was pretty good. And then they finally moved onto a feud with a bit of weight and reason for being behind it. 10 years after his push was derailed at the hands of the Viper, Kofi and Randy Orton fought at SummerSlam and the match, oh, the match ended because Randy looked at Kofi's kids and Kofi went into a pancake panic and they fought to a double count out and it was the worst thing. Fun fact, at SummerSlam the year before, the WWE Championship match also didn't main event. Had a deeply personal feud end with a rubbish non-finish when the champion got a rage on when his family were mentioned and kicked too much ass and everyone hated that as well. It's just the same mistakes over and over again. What's the f point of being alive. At Clash of Champions, Kofi beat Randy Orton in a slow match, by which point no one really cared because the Summer Sam thing was so shit. And then, on the October 4th episode of SmackDown, the debut of SmackDown on Fox to pop the network execs and set up a Saudi Arabia blood money past its prime UFC feud, which would result in one single terrible match. Brock Lesnar defeated Kofi Kingston in eight seconds to win the WWE Championship, ending Kingston's 180 day reign in a single move. And look, I understand why they did it. I know they wanted to do a big thing for SmackDown's big day. They were using the title change to promote for the future. And I've been pretty public about the fact that I do quite like the presentation of Brock Lesnar as this unassailable evil twat with a belt, but it was how they did it 
which is just so f***ing insulting. Yes, eight seconds, one move. That sucks. But what sucks more was literally the next week on SmackDown, seven days later, Kofi immediately slid down the card, appearing in a segment with New Day, holding pancakes, and smiling, promoting Susan G. Combe and having a meaningless six-man tag with the New Day versus the OC. And at no point, literally no point, Kofi cut a promo on the show. He cut a promo on that SmackDown. At no point did Kofi mention the fact that he was WWE champion seven f***ing days earlier. Nor did he even slightly express an interest in getting the championship. The high point of an 11-year career, he's waited too long Back. There was a brief reference to it at the Royal Rumble when he turned up to a big bloody f***ing pop, lest we forget, to challenge Brock in the Rumble match before being soundly defeated yet again. It, it was, it's maddening. Genuinely, Jinder Mahal got more aftercare when his WWE Championship reign ended. And that was something that, well, I and some other people, it, that's something we actually want to forget. Not everyone though, because some of you a wankers. But no, Kofi was done. His character suffered overnight amnesia and his aspirations were never mentioned again. After suffering with the puppy that their kid brought home for almost a full calendar year, WWE, the parents finally managed to put a bullet in the puppy's head. And when their kid got upset about it, they were like, I mean, you're lucky you even had a puppy at all. And also, you never had a puppy. Now, how about Cain Velasquez? Should we go on holiday with him? It'll be short. Bollocks. Bollocks to it all. Let me have a go. Now look, let's not look at things with rose-tinted glasses. Kofi's WWE Championship reign wasn't very good. Some of that is down to the fact that like AJ Styles' long run with the WWE Championship the year before, and to some extent, CM Punk's 434 day title reign before that, that during his tenure, the WWE title was treated as an upper mid-card belt, a combination of lesser opponents in some cases. So, so I do like you, Dolph. WWE non-finishes to sell the next pay-per-view booking, but also in the ring, Kofi wasn't that dynamic a champion. Sorry, sorry. He, it, it wasn't very good for a combination of reasons. See, after the Daniel Bryan match at Mania, the matches didn't reach the same quality. Kofi's great, he really is. But the chase was over. The magical moment had been achieved. And without that contentious relationship between WWE and its fans, without the fans feeling like WWE was denying them something that they'd always wanted, which is when the fans are most vocal in this era anyway, the enthusiasm for Kofi Kingston, WWE Champion, just gradually ebbed away. I understand that. But that also shouldn't be treated like an inevitability because Kofi is great, for one. And second, it doesn't excuse the fact that Kofi got no follow-up. Like, you've made a new WWE Champion. He was champion for 180 days. And even without the racial optics, which a lot of people will reject, of the whitest, most Aryan man you can find reclaiming the belt on Fox and the black guy just immediately going back to knowing his place with a smile, even without that lens, it's just objectively shit storytelling. WWE, you are asking us to watch your show every single week based on the consequences of people's actions and how the characters you're presenting to us are going to react to their circumstances. No matter how you look at it, this kind of booking actively hurts the audience's desire to tune in to see what their favorite characters are up to because their favorite characters don't act like people. I mean, honestly, like this is why most of the audience doesn't stick around. So that's the point of this booking. Give Kofi more opponents to play into his strengths, have the WWE Championship main event some pay-per-views and have the reign end in a way that treats the character of Kofi Kingston with a little bloody dignity. We start in the build up to WrestleMania 35. The only things that change here are, one, Mustafa Ali does not compete for the WWE Championship at Fastlane. Instead, it's just Kevin Owens versus Daniel Bryan. And two, let's clear up Vince's motivations a little, shall we? Instead of just avoiding the issues and just relying on B plus player to take care of it, have Vince actually make it clear that, look, Kofi, I like you. You're, you've been great over the last 10 years. You know, thanks for your service. But if you were going to be a main event star, 
we're looking at a decade, Kofi. You would have done it already. Now, you don't seem to understand. I'm all for opportunities, pal, but this is WrestleMania we're talking about, the biggest show of the year. We are talking about the WWE Championship match at WrestleMania. Now, I'm sorry, but it, it is too big a spotlight, and I am not willing to risk you challenging for that title, making my show lesser than. I'm sorry, there you go, simple as that. The logical reasoning is you will hurt WrestleMania with this crusade of yours, so know your place. Let's move on. And Kofi says, no, after 11 years of doing just that, this might be my only chance. I won't let it go. So then we have Kofi winning the bell at WrestleMania like it happened, lovely moment, not changing a thing. Except that in the aftermath of the show, Daniel Bryan takes out all of his aggression on Eric Rowan, fires him from his retinue, breaks his arm, loses the plot. After WrestleMania, big celebration for Kofi with the New Day, and instead of immediately going into a champion versus champion match, a unification match, no less, with Seth Rollins on Raw, which is incredibly dumb because A, we've just seen two baby faces win their belts and we don't want to see either of them lose their belt just yet. And B, there's absolutely zero chance of that match ending any other way than disappointingly. And hey, look, a disappointing finish. Just a bad old thing, like straight out of the gate for Kofi's title reign. It completely unnecessary. Instead, let's do the interesting story that for some reason WWE never really attempted to do, except super briefly two years later via the turd smeared filter of retribution, which was bad. And that's Kofi versus Mustafa Ali. Kofi's out there with the new day. There's pancakes in the shape of the WWE Championship. There are tearful words from Big E and Xavier Woods about how this is the proudest moment of their lives. It's an honor to stand here and watch someone who deserves this so much achieving their dream. And when Kofi finally gets a chance to, to hold the mic, to say a few words, Ali's music hits. Mustafa Ali comes down and says, look, First of all, I just want to say congratulations. You deserve it. Gets a you deserve it chant going. But here's the thing. I deserved it too. Woods and Biggie are like, dude, like we get it, but read the room. This isn't your moment. And Ali responds, well, <laughs> it should have been. It should have been. Kofi, I'm talking to you, not your boys. You talked about waiting for this, waiting too long. Well, I'm not gonna make that mistake, Kofi. I'm not waiting. I was kicked in the head and through no fault of my own, I was taken out of the chamber. I wanted to keep going. I wrestled with my concussion because this was my dream too. I would have won the Elimination Chamber and then I would have gone on to beat you at WrestleMania. I should be WWE Champion right now. So I'm coming out here with the chance for you to do the right thing. Turns to the crowd, asks, why are you booing me? I'm right, and he is, kind of, but he's just being a dick about it, which is the perfect heel reasoning. A quirk of fate took something from Mustafa Ali and gave it to Kofi, and if Kofi doesn't realize it, that if Kofi doesn't realize that he's lucky, Kofi should do the gracious thing and let Ali have next, and Kofi, he realizes Mustafa Ali's being a bit of a dick about this, but he accepts. The match is made for Money in the Bank. In the build to Money in the Bank, Xavier Woods and Big E win the right to compete against the Usos for the SmackDown Tag Championships, and Ali slowly turns to the dark side before finally snapping. On an episode of SmackDown for the show, the Usos blindside the New Day, take them out, Kofi runs down to help out where he's attacked by Mustafa Ali. Ali takes Kofi, puts his head between the stairs and the ring post, and kicks it as hard as he can. He's trying to give Kofi a concussion, the injury that robbed him of his WWE Championship opportunity. Kofi is cleared to compete just 
but he's banged up. So at Money in the Bank, we've got the following matches. Daniel Bryan defeats Eric Rowan by capitalizing on the injured arm. Big E and Xavier Woods defeat the Usos to win the SmackDown Tag Team Championships, and Kofi successfully defends in a 15-minute Hopefully Barnstormer, because both guys are good. Match against Ali, a top level worker. Kofi fights out from underneath an injured head to beat him. Super strong, super clean. New day at the end of the night. Hold all the gold. The next pay-per-view is Stomping Grounds, because I really truly don't give a shit about Super Showdown or booking around it. In order to keep the Kofi Kingston having top quality pay-per-view matches as champion train going, let's just reinsert Daniel Bryan into Kofi's life, shall we? New Day are in the ring after Money in the Bank when Daniel Bryan comes out to confront them. Don't think that I forgot what you stole from me. I had a bit of business to take care of last month, but now I am putting you on notice. The fairy tale is coming to an end. I know why you won, Kofi. I know why you won. Power of friendship, right? Positivity. Because of course, it was never going to be a fair fight. Was it with your cheerleaders in your corner, watching your back? It's unfair. It's unworthy of a WWE champion. So I decided to make some new friends of my own. And that is when Woods and Big E are attacked from behind by the men now known as FTR, The Revival. Daniel Bryan beats down Kofi Kingston. Daniel Bryan and The Revival form a super group, a super worker super group and stand tall. This leads to a winner take all six man tag team match at Stomping Grounds. Daniel Bryan and The Revival versus The New Day for both the WWE Championship and the SmackDown tag titles. I just want to see that. Don't you want to see that? I want to see that. I mean, did you watch Stomping Grounds? That was main evented by Seth Rollins versus Baron Corbin. Just a thought. How about this? With three belts on the line, main events instead. It's just a thought. At the pay-per-view, Kofi pins Dash Wilder and the New Day retain all of their belts as the brotherhood of best friends. Obviously, Daniel Bryan wasn't pinned in that match, so he's still got a massive cob on about the whole thing. No, no, which sends us to extreme rules. And instead of one match, between New Day and the supergroup. What should we call them? I genuinely haven't written this in the script. What should we call Daniel Bryan and the Revival? Dad's on tour. At Extreme Rules, there's two matches featuring those teams. A ladder match for the SmackDown Tag Team titles, the Revival versus New Day, and in the show's main event, not Seth and Becky versus Baron Corbin and Lacey Evans. Shock horror, that can open the show, please. Can also end with Brock's cash in, you know, whatever, that, that's fine, but instead, the main event of Extreme Rules is a 30-minute Iron Man match, Kofi Kingston versus Daniel Bryan, with Bryan making it his mission to expose Kofi Kingston as a fluke champion that just relies on his friends. At Extreme Rules, The Revival beat The New Day to be crowned the new SmackDown Tag Team Champion, setting up the vibe of, oh no, The New Day's world is crumbling in the first 15 minutes of the Iron Man match, Daniel Bryan cheats to go 2-0 up on Kofi. Really book it to get the crowd behind him. There's parallels here with the gauntlet match that started all of this. Kofi struggling to get to his feet, time running out on him. Kofi mania ending how it began. But of course, Kofi fights back to equalize before hitting one last trouble in paradise at the 10 second mark to snag a 3-2 victory, definitively beating the new Daniel Bryan. And then after this is where you have the Orton match. And note the use of the singular there. Match, Kofi Kingston versus Randy Orton at SummerSlam, one and done. Absolutely do the feud. It's a great story and so far, in this booking, every feud for Kofi has made sense. Ali's lost opportunity, Daniel Bryan's quest for revenge after Mania, and now we escalate it with a feud 10 years in the making. All the stuff worked that WWE put into it. I succeeded not because of you, but despite you, Randy. And Randy said, you weren't good enough, Kofi, back then. 
And the thing that will really break your heart, not just losing the title, not just losing it in front of the world, but the fact that after 11 years of the grind, as you put it, you're still not good enough to beat me. So SummerSlam, Kofi versus Orton, good. It's a good story. Let's just provide it with an ending. On the biggest stage, SummerSlam, when the focal point of the entire match is Randy is better than Kofi and one RKO will end everything. Have Kofi managed to keep avoiding the RKO, keep slipping out of it, driving Randy Orton increasingly mad to the point where Randy gets angry so that it mirrors that famous match back in 2009. He is beside himself with rage, have him run back for the punt, run in, trouble in paradise, f you, pin, done. Story over. When it mattered, while people were most interested in the story, Orton puts Kofi over on the biggest stage he can, everything tied off, nice and neat. R wrestling, it's just not that hard. You don't have to make it this hard. Is Kofi versus Orton gonna main event SummerSlam over Lesnar versus Rollins? No, probably not. So, Let's put the WWE Championship back in the spotlight at Clash of Champions. And in line with that event being all about titles, champions, what it's like to hold a championship, the concept of putting the champion under the biggest amount of threat, main event the show with a six pack challenge for the WWE Championship. Kofi defending the belt against Randy Orton, Daniel Bryan, Kevin Owens, Roman Reigns, and Alistair Black. You don't want to do a match like this all the time, absolutely, because it can make the title picture seem a little undefined, unfocused, but once in a while, if you want to really nail down that this belt is important and this champion is important, it also gives you the chance to have an atmosphere so chaotic that if Kofi retains, which he does here by the way, then he's sure he's technically beaten everyone, but also no one really loses anything in defeat because there's just so much madness going on. At the pay-per-view, Kofi wins, stands tall in ultimate victory as the head of the SmackDown roster, and that it's when Brock Lesnar's music hits. He heads up to the ring, he plants Kofi with an F5, and this sets up Kofi versus Brock Lesnar, not on a random ass episode of SmackDown. Okay, it wasn't a random ass episode of SmackDown, I'll grant you, but also, f Fox, no special treats for you. Instead, the two square off inside hell. And, I and Brock spends the entire month leading up to that match Killing the New Day, destroying Big E and Xavier Woods, delivering F5s on the outside of the ring to both men, destroying Kofi's friends, all as Paul Heyman outlines that Kofi is a fantastic physical champion, but mentally, he's weak. All it took was taking out your little buds, your annoying, brittle little besties and you've completely lost your edge. And Brock Lesnar will tangle you up in your rage and he will choke you with it. Brock has been through hell and on Sunday, he will be your guide. And I'm sorry to say it, I really am, but Brock Lesnar at Hell in a Cell beats Kofi Kingston to become new WWE Champion. But at least this way, it happens in a match rather than in a GIF. After the match, Brock takes a steel chair to Kofi's leg, the one that earlier in the match caught him with a trouble in paradise for a close two. He repeatedly smashes the chair over Kofi's leg over and over and over, putting Kofi out for months. While he's gone around TLC, time, WWE conduct interviews with Kofi Kingston in his house, talking about Kofi's rehab and how this has been the worst few months of Kofi Kingston's life. The WWE Championship was everything to him and, and failing like that, maybe, just maybe, Kofi's lost the power of positivity. This takes us to the Royal Rumble where Brock is doing his Brock thing and by the way, I, I do want it on the record that the stretch of Brock Lesnar in the 2020 Rumble is 
legit one of my favorite Rumble memories. Like Brock's brilliant, gang. Sorry, sorry about that, but he is. And at number 10, out comes Kofi Kingston, making his first appearance on WWE programming in more than two months. He is back and he fucking goes for Brock Lesnar. And basically, Kofi just replaces Ricochet in the real life booking of how it went. He gets Brock in the balls, leading to the Claymore from McIntyre, eliminating Brock Lesnar. Kofi then goes on to last in the Rumble, doing more of his crazy spots until late in the match, maybe fifth or sixth from the end before being eliminated by Roman Reigns. Again, heat Roman up before Drew scoops all that adulation for eventually eliminating Roman for the win, which leads to our final stop in this story. Elimination Chamber 2020. One year on from the birthplace of Kofi Mania, where he came up so desperately sure against the new Daniel Bryan. Kofi challenges Brock Lesnar for the WWE Championship. He is not afraid. He wants this more than he's wanted anything. And that will fuel him to do what no one believes that he can do. He will beat Brock Lesnar. And at Elimination Chamber, he does not do that. Sorry. <laughs> Kofi puts up a great fight, but Lesnar beats Kingston one more time. All the heat in the world, ready and waiting for Drew McIntyre, the new star to take his turn in the spotlight and conquer the beast at WrestleMania 36, admittedly in total silence in an empty room. And that's a shame. And that is how Kofi Mania ends. Not ultimately in victory, no, but at least it ends in a way that makes sense. Kofi loses the title, gets crushed, fights back, keeps his sight set on the title and comes up short. That's fine. But at least he doesn't lose that underdog drive, that ambition, that purpose that drove us all to get behind him on the road to WrestleMania 35. And that is how I would book Kofi Mania and the, I guess, more how I would book Kofi Kingston's WWE title run. Do you disagree? Do, do you, am I a bastard for having Brock win? Sorry, I guess, sorry. Please subscribe to Parts of Unknown. And also let me know in the comments what else you'd like me to book. Cause it's hard to come up with these ideas. I've booked most things. So if you could help me out, that would be appreciated. We'll see you soon. Jam that jam.